Whilst infamy will always remember William Joyce as the English personification of the Nazis, he was neither the original Lord Haw Haw, nor the only English or American broadcaster to serve the propaganda arm of Hitler's Third Reich. The prospect of internment drove many British and English-speaking Nazi sympathizers to Germany in the build-up to the Second World War. Others went there out of fanaticism for Hitler. Some were merely adventurers, caught up in the naive excitement surrounding a rapidly rising power, unaware of the horrific crimes that Hitler had planned. Yet the First Lord Haw Haw was, almost certainly, German. Wolf Mittler was a professional journalist working in German radio, who was roped into the early Nazi propaganda broadcasts to England. A fluent English speaker, courtesy of his Irish-born mother, his Bertie Worcester-style caricature of an Englishman led radio critic Jonah Barrington to refer to that style as Haw Haw. It's not known for certain that it was to him Barrington was referring when the term was coined, but as the preeminent voice for the Germany Calling program, it was likely Mittler that Barrington was hearing, at least in the early days. Unlike the vast majority of the others, Mittler was not a Nazi, nor even particularly political. His lack of enthusiasm led to his replacement on Germany calling. In 1943, the Nazis became suspicious of his true sympathies. After initially fleeing to Italy, the Gestapo caught up with and arrested him. Managing to escape to Switzerland, he returned to Germany following the war, enjoying an extensive career in German radio and television. This included covering momentous events, providing live translations of John F. Kennedy's speech on the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Apollo 11 moon landing. He lived until 2002, without any stain on his character from the Nazi era. Mittler's replacement on Germany calling was Norman Bailey Stewart, a former British Army officer who had left the military in disgrace after being convicted of spying for a foreign power. He had fallen for a German woman in 1931. Attempting to gain German citizenship, he recklessly offered to spy for them. After being caught and sentenced to five years, he had the distinction of being the last prisoner to be held in the Tower of London. Following his release, the disgraced Bailey Stewart drifted to Austria, where he was originally expelled under suspicion of being a Nazi agent. Hitler's takeover of the country allowed him a route back, and when he critiqued the Germany calling broadcasts at a party of Nazi sympathizers in Vienna, he was invited to audition for the role himself, which he did successfully. A week before Britain declared war on Germany, he made his first broadcast. Yet Bailey Stewart would be spared the hangman after the war. His broadcasting career was a very short one, followed by non-treasonous translator roles at the German Foreign Ministry that would see him serve just five years after the war. He was becoming disillusioned with Nazism. In addition, he was being outshone by his then obscure understudy on Germany calling, a broadcasting superstar in the making, named William Joyce. Bailey Stewart settled in Dublin and lived a quiet family life until his death from a heart attack in 1966. Dorothy Eckersley a confirmed Nazi sympathizer who moved to Germany in 1939, was a close friend of Joyce and was directly responsible for bringing the penniless and unemployed drifter into broadcasting after a chance meeting in Berlin. Eckersley was also a broadcaster, providing links and announcements in the English language service. She also brought her son, James Clark, 
into the business of broadcasting Nazi propaganda. After 1941, following infighting among the broadcasting community, both mother and son were sidelined, but the Germans still regarded James as an asset. In 1944, they attempted to bring James back, but mother and son no longer wanted to participate, and they ended up in an internment camp. After the war, both were charged with treason, but were no longer considered enthusiastic Nazis, especially James, who was thought to be entirely under the influence of his mother. He received a suspended sentence, while his mother only received 12 months. Raymond Davies Hughes was a Welsh RAF airman who made broadcasts after being taken prisoner when forced to bail out of an RAF bomber over Germany in 1943. A complete opportunist, he fell somewhat unwittingly into the clutches of the Nazis. Having been tricked into thinking he was collecting POW information for the Red Cross in the camps, information that was later used in interrogation, he found himself compromised, but was rewarded with special privileges. Upon agreeing to make broadcasts in Welsh to Welsh troops fighting in the Italian campaign, he was moved to Berlin. There, Hughes enjoyed a high degree of freedom, with his own flat and a salary. Sometime in 1944, though, he displeased the Nazis in some way or other, was stripped of his privileges and sent back to a POW camp. Charged with multiple counts of aiding the enemy after the war, he was found partially guilty and sentenced to five years hard labour, reduced to two on appeal. Since there was no suggestion that he was ever a Nazi and was purely in it for his own ends, he returned to society and lived normally until his death in 1999. There's lots more to come in this video, but please consider subscribing. Thank you. A number of Americans also made broadcasts for the Nazis via shortwave radio to the US, both before and after American entry into the war. Frederick Kaltenbach was born in Iowa, the son of a German emigre father. Kaltenbach and his brother happened to be on a cycling tour of Germany when World War I broke out. But despite being detained for a few months on suspicion of spying, his enthusiasm for all things German was undimmed. After several years teaching back home in Iowa, he gained a scholarship to the University of Berlin in 1933, where he became an ardent follower of the Nazis. This didn't go down well when he returned home, and he left for Germany again in 1936. Taking a translator's job for German radio, he soon graduated to broadcasting propaganda. Letters to Iowa, a program in the form of fictional letters home, beginning with the words, Greetings to my old friend Harry in Iowa, disseminated anti-British, pro-isolation propaganda, discouraging American involvement in European matters. Once America entered the war, his broadcasts became actionable. Knowing this, and feeling disillusioned with Nazism, Kaltenbach's broadcasts diminished greatly. With a treason charge hanging over his head and declining health, near the end of the war he sought to ingratiate himself with anti-Nazi elements but to no avail. The Soviets arrested him in Berlin, refusing to hand him over to the Americans, and Kaltenbach died in a prisoner of war camp shortly afterwards. Robert Best was a foreign correspondent covering Europe for US media outlets in the interwar period. Based in Vienna, he gradually came to sympathize with Hitler after their occupation of Austria. Having been fired by U.S. publications, he offered his services to the Nazis, but was initially rebuffed. When the U.S. declared war, he was arrested for the purposes of deportation, 
but this time was able to convince the Nazis to put him behind a microphone. His first broadcast coming on the 10th of April 1942. He broadcast as Mr. Guess Who, with the usual diatribes against Roosevelt, Jews, Churchill and Bolshevism, yet with an unbridled vehemence that made him something of a standout. As defeat loomed for Nazi Germany, he fled Vienna, but left behind documents which identified him as Mr. Guess Who. Captured by the British in January 1946 and handed over to US forces, he was convicted of 12 counts of treason and sentenced to life. He died in prison of a brain hemorrhage on the 16th of December 1952. Douglas Chandler was a Chicago-born former U.S. Navy officer who became a journalist. Ruined in the Wall Street crash of 1929, he moved first to France, then Germany, becoming a reporter for National Geographic. His articles for them led to later criticism that the magazine had been far too favourable to Nazi Germany. Chandler's propaganda broadcasts for German state radio began in April 1941 under the pseudonym Paul Revere. The program began with clattering hooves and Yankee Doodle Dandy, followed by exhortations to the US to stay out of the war and confront the threats of Bolshevism. Dubbed America's Lord Haw Haw for his cultivated voice, he was one of the top earners on German state radio. Following the war, he was arrested then released by US forces, before finally being tried for treason in 1946. His plea of insanity failed, and his conviction brought with it a sentence of life imprisonment. He served only 16 years though, being released by President Kennedy on condition that he leave the United States. He was last known to be living quietly in the Canary Islands in the 1970s and is presumed to have died there. The story of the English-language Nazi propaganda effort on radio is a fascinating one, filled with equally fascinating characters. But as with so many things, in a complex web, with a cast of dozens or even hundreds. Infamy or stardom falls only on the few, or the one. Eighty years on, history seems to have forgotten all the others. Only remembering the man who was its Johnny come lately, it's not even original Lord Haw Haw, but it's radio superstar. William Joyce. Germany calling, Germany calling, Germany calling.